Hello. Hi, humans. <laughs> so, now we begin. And so we begin. So let's see, we were talking backstage about why this era is different and like sort of like, how do we call what you call the technic? The technic and also the technopoly right? or, by Neil Postman. Or if you guys will forgive uh, a little bit of the punniness, like we now live in the, like a new epoch, we live in the epoch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And geologists often call it the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene, exactly. So, or the, so that we can get Technocene. Yes. Yeah. The Techscene. The Tech, yeah. It's a little, a little awkward. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't roll off the tongue. No. No. But uh, I think it's actually a really important thing to call out that, you know, these things that sit in our pockets now are the sense-making devices by which we understand the world. These are sort of the GPSs um, I mean, this and technology more broadly, mm -hmm. that we navigate, that we make meaning, mm -hmm. we decide what's valuable to us, like w how we even like come to what is our identity, all comes through technology. Well, I, I would actually go further than that. Okay. And one of the things that happened recently, interestingly, is that Aza um, belongs to a collective of art and technologists. And he recently had a dinner that he hosted at his house. A bunch of um, very well-known uh, technologists were, were attending there. And one of the things that I realized, actually, mm. during the course of that conversation, when we, were, when we were sitting around the dinner table, was that all of us were working on the project of humanizing technology. That we were all working towards making the human either a recognizable part of what we were building, adapting technology to human needs, um, you know, making sure that the tendency of technology to dehumanize is curbed. Yeah. And what I realized also is that a lot of us that were in the room were um, software designers, software developers. We'd been working at places such as Facebook and Google and um, you know, all of the various companies that, that I, have, I have worked at and all the startups that, that we've been building. And that we've been actually addressing an incredibly small part of the problem. Mm. We are basically, and, I, and I have, I've, I've been, this is like my fourth time actually up on the, up on the slush stage. Yeah. And the, um, and You've actually actually been uh, at least that many times up on this last day. Just this, just this <laughs> slash. The last couple of um, days. I'm realizing, but the but that the um, that the thing that we've been talking about is actually changing the way that we build software. We've been talking about the way that we design our apps, you know, how much we use our phones. But what occurred to me at that meeting was. Number one, mm. all of us are very earnest in our efforts, yeah. but isn't it a little bit like the foxes guarding the hen house, yeah. right? How are the technologists going to actually change the technology when we come from that orientation ourselves? And I was, I was realizing that as we were having that conversation that, that all of us were coming from a very technological orientation and not from outside of that. And one of my particular um, you know, kind of bugs or features is that I come from the humanities, you also studied music, yep. and we come from places outside of technology, and so we have a different perspective on the technology and how to build it. And really, what we're talking about actually is many layers up above the feature set of the software that we're, we're building. What we're actually talking about is the reality. We're talking mm. about the technic. I call it the technic. Mm. I've been reading recently a bunch of um, Italian philosophers, Francesco Bifabarati and uh, Federico Campagna, who talk about the technic. Mm. And the technic, as I understand it, comes also partially from the idea of, of, of um, how everything in the world, everything that we see around them, the chairs we sit on, the, the, the floor beneath us, the ceiling, the very trees that are in nature have become, as Heidegger says in his essay, Questions Concerning Technology, standing stock. Standing stock. Everything is standing stock. Trees are not trees, the forest is not the forest, it's standing stock. It's waiting there with um, you know, technological use. And he says, um, I think this is very interesting, he says that technology itself is not inherently 
technical. It's not technological. Mm -hmm. It's this idea of being there, waiting, and being seen as, and having a use as only these things, such as standing stock. Human yeah. beings are just their potential labor. And the thing that's happened to us is that we have become, um, as is dictated by the world around us, and look at, look at the world around you right now, and look at the things that you see, and look at the lights in this room, and the, uh, you know, everything, the people around you, and the conversation that's having up on stage, and the screens that it's also being projected upon, all of this is the technic, mm. and we are in it. We are completely immersed in it. And the thing to remember about it, it is a constructed reality. It is a recently constructed reality, and as such, it is a changeable reality. It is something that we ourselves invented, and we ourselves can reject. And, you know, for example, Ursula Le Guin, the science fiction oh. writer, <laughs> who we both love, yeah. um, you, know, you know, she writes that capitalism in our world seems as if it is an ine inevitability. It is absolutely inescapable. It's everything that we do. It's everything that we see around us. It is um, why we do the work that we do. It's the, the you know, reason we design all that software yep. that we design. Yep. I'm a venture capitalist myself. And, um, she said that it seems as if it is that way, but so was once the divine right of kings. Mm -hmm. How do we change this reality? I know you have some ideas about this. <laughs> um, just a simple 20-minute conversation. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it, one of the things, like, thinking about the way that technology is affecting humanity now, right? Like, um, we're not, we're, we're a complicated species. Like, we're, we're not exactly, go. Oh. Did I disappear? Hello. Can you no. hear us? Can you, can you guys hear, or did I just disappear? Can you hear us? No. No. OK, we've gone offline. Well, this is great. Now we can talk about all the real thing. Oh, here we go. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, thinking about the way that technology affects humanity, um, oh, that's what you're saying. Uh, humanity is not, I mean, we're a complicated species. Like we are not purely good, we're not purely evil, um, and the environments that we live in dictate so much about our behavior. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we have this, <laughs> we're, I, we're, now, we're now 10 minutes in, seven minutes in, we're gonna get to the free will conversation, um, <laughs> which is like, one of the things I think we know as designers is that human beings don't have as much free will as they think they do. Yes. Um, and we're way more easily hackable. Mm -hmm. um, so the Stanford prison experiment, mm -hmm. like my takeaway from that, right, this is where you, like, you take a set of undergraduate and graduate Stanford students, you randomly split them, one group becomes a, um, prisoners, the other group becomes prisoner guards, um, and they had to stop the study a couple days in because even though these students all knew that the other people were students, the act of being in an environment um, which feels oppressive, the prisoner guards started to abuse strip search, do all these terrible things to dehumanize the prisoners. And my takeaway from this is not that humanity is a terrible race. My takeaway is that people by and large operate in the environment that they're mm -hmm. given, and they just sort of like take the path of least resistance. We act the way that we're sort of expected to. And so then I think about like the technic. Yeah. This is like, it, it's sort of like building a garden. Um, you can't control any individual human being or any visual plants like progress, how it, how it blooms, but you can certainly affect the, the, how nice a garden is to be in. You can affect the overall structure. And when I think about how do we build technology that understands that we as human beings are very persuadable and manipulatable, um, right? All it took, so 55% of plastic surgeons in the US uh, now say, report having seen patients that come in and ask to look like their selfie filters. All it took to get this was a couple of like buttons and a counter um, and showing those images to other people to get social validation, to climb so far down people's brain stems that they're willing to go under the knife and change how they physically look. Um, to look more To look like more like the thing that our technology tells yes, them that they wanted yes. to. And I think that's sort of what you sort of mean about the, like, the technic, is that we live in this invisible sphere of identity and influence that we 
uh, both feel that it's inevitable, it's just how things are, and yet can change so quickly if we, if we, if we but here's the But here's the thing that I'm actually questioning. Okay. Is the inevitability of this. I hear this over and over again, and I hear everybody say, well, it's a done deal. Yeah. It's already happened. There's no escape. We're in it. Right. How do we, how do we uh, you know, ever escape it? We don't. Right? Do you believe that? I no. mean, because I actually don't believe that. I, I mean, I'm, I I'm actually that. very skeptical about that. And every, everybody always says that, well, that ship has already sailed. Yeah. That's already done. And, and to me, um, I'm a born disruptor, mm. right? I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, just, just like the status quo, whatever the status quo is. And this was, you know, when I started my career, whatever that was, 20 years ago or, or more. I, I, I enjoyed, I have, yeah. you know, as we kind of have previously discussed, um, have a have a great love for uh, kind of identifying kind of what's wrong with the current reality and yep. then trying to trying to disrupt it, right? I think that that is the common tendency among a lot of the people that are in the audience here today and the people that work in technology is that there's an, a certain attraction to the idea of disruption, yep. right? Um, and that we have the ability to actually change things, but um, you know. It does seem as if this has been a fairly, um, not very well thought up disruption, right? Yep. It's been yep. kind of very, um, let's say, move fast and break things <laughs> kind of yep. kind of disruption. And you know, as we've as we've we've seen amply demonstrated, um, things have been broken. Yep. Well, I, I think back to other times when this is why I completely agree. Things are not inevitable, um, and I think the one of the, the saving graces here is like the future we're moving towards is one that I don't think very many people want to have happen. No, um, no. And you know, there have been other times when there's this kind of like game theory, right? Because we're in this weird game theory around like capturing human attention. Um, actually, you asked me uh, when, uh, a while ago, like why is it that we systematically abuse animals um, in factory farms and... Yeah. Uh, and I think the answer there, uh, originally, oh, maybe it's the enlightenment thinking and it's like transcendence and like ascendance of man over animal. Maybe like, no, mm. actually it's much simpler. It's just the game theory of the cultures that outcompeted other cultures are the one that learned to use animals as resources to exploit. Mm -hmm. And it's the same kind of game theory going on here now, which is what companies are now outcompeting all the other companies, the ones that have greater than 50% uh, of the like stock market value in the U.S. Oh, these are companies that are learning to use human beings and our attention as resources to exploit. Getting yes. back to the, sort yes. of the Heidegger point. Yes. Um, so when has this kind of game theory happened before? Well, actually, slavery um, had the same kind of game theory where the British Empire couldn't step off of slavery because if they're like, if we do that, well. France's economy is just going to surge ahead. Mm -hmm. They're going to have a huge competitive advantage. So it's impossible. How could we possibly do this thing? Um, and when, uh, when Great Britain did step off the slavery uh, train or ship, um, they had to sacrifice 2% of their GDP for 60 years. But the way they did it is they ended up being a human rights issue. It's a thing that everyone said, this is now mm -hmm. morally repugnant. This is not the way you treat human beings. And so we can all agree to slowly step away at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think the exact same thing is true now, whether you think about it from like up here at the capitalist uh, sort of like stack or down here at the attention economy kind of stack. We, we can make that yeah. same kind of like. Well, I, I do think that, you know, we, you know I, I, I come from the, the, um, the ancient days of uh, the web 2.0. <laughs> and and it, during that era of building uh, software for people, we were building what we thought of and what we considered to be building was online communities. Yeah. And, and um, you, know, you know, as they came to be called social media, as they came to be attention and gathering devices, as they came to actually be very exploitive, yeah. um, you know, in their in their outlook, a lot of that was lost. And I I do think that that core of what I what I saw as a culture of generosity in the very early days of the internet mm. and a very collaborative. Um, community-oriented, participatory, non-passive mm -hmm. um, participation and the building of cultures yep. um, is something that you know I think was really built in in the early days of the internet. We saw that I saw that in you know the the well, right? The kind of the Howard Rheingold, Stuart Brand era of yeah. the internet, and kind of subsequent to that. And I think that it was only in I would say the past. I, I actually I actually kind of. Um, 
myself peg there are a lot of there are a lot of wrong turns along the way, and I think that that uh, you know as we kind of saw uh, you know especially social media and, and you know Twitter and Facebook especially become dominant, that the point at which it turned was the activity feed. Yeah. Actually, this is this is actually what I what I think it happened was when it was sorted by attention. Mm -hmm. That to me was the crucial point at which things went wrong, and that you could buy your way into someone's attention that could be advertisers or it could be foreign governments. And so I, yep. I, I, I really see some of these um, being dependent on business models. Yep. I yep. see a lot of them you know, in the early days of Flickr when we were building that. It was entirely paid for by subscription. And one of the things that's happened right now is that Flickr has been uh, um, sold to it was it, it belonged to Yahoo and then subsequently to Verizon and then became part of SmugMug, is now going back to a subscription model, mm -hmm. and very clearly is stating, we are not going to harvest and sell your data. You are not a product, product. to be sold. You know, it, it's a it's an interesting. It's returning to that, and I was very yeah. happy to see that. I, it makes me wonder uh, as we move. Selling, I, I really like your point, selling brand is almost identical to selling ideology. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much inevitable as you started yes. to step down that yes. path of selling attention that we would have state actors and foreign actors vying to essentially, I think of it as a drift attack. They find what, actually in the last US election, I think this is fascinating, the 2018 one, the 2016, uh, Russia did a lot of content creation. Yes. Um, in 2018, they stopped doing that. They're like, actually, it's even more effective to find people's positions, um, whether it's Black Lives Matter or the Women's March, and just extremize those views, to take them and push them even further. Because further, they, yes. They work yes. in the attention economy. To create a, a greater divide. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know what I'd like to, like to talk a little bit about is, um, Ways out, like the yeah. the paths or the islands in the technic yeah. that um, that serve humanity in a way that um, is not immediately obvious. I think to a lot of people, especially those of us who work in the industry and are surrounded every day with you know all of our our multiple screens and yep. um, devices and and all of that kind of thing. And um, I'm actually gonna, I secretly hit a little piece of paper in my pocket uh. and have a quote that I'm gonna read. <laughs> So this is um, this is what I call um, Darwin's regret, and I think that it's a regret that a lot of um, people who work in the sciences and technology share. Yeah. And this was written by uh, Charles Darwin in a letter to a friend mm. um, towards the end of his life. Mm. My mind has changed during the last 20 or 30 years. Now, for many years, I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. I have also almost lost my taste for pictures or music. Mm. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding out general laws from large collections of facts. Mm. If I had my life to live again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness. Mm and many and may possibly be injurious to the intellect and more probably to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part mm. of our nature. Mm. I'm, wow. I'm reminded of the, there's a Peruvian phrase, uh, which is sickness is the inability to appreciate the beauty of a flower. Yes. And these yes. two things actually feel very sympathetic. That's though. very, very, very similar. And um, I do think that, you know, we come from the valley and, of course, see, as I read a, a psychologist describe it, so much success and so little happiness. Yeah. And yeah. Um, my, my orientation, and my, I'm actually a, a kind of an accidental technologist. I was, I was originally studying Renaissance literature when I um, accidentally uh, uh, fell into the tech industry being in San Francisco <laughs> in the mid-90s, <laughs> which is a, a, a kind of a, um, 
irresistible attraction yep. and, and, and fascinating. And it was, it was very clearly the creation of new worlds. But I think now, you know, so many years later, we can see the danger of, 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 what, of what we have become. And, yep. um, you know, I originally, I originally came out to California to get a, a PhD in, in uh, basically, I studied Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, was my, my main area of study. And we, we somehow have, have lost the ability to see that. You were, I remember we were having a conversation yeah. um, previously. Um, uh, I'm producing a, an upcoming podcast. And um, one of the things that you said really uh, terrified you is that people started talking about post nature. Yeah, yeah. Post nature. You know, we're, we live in a post-nature world. Um, you know, it's really fascinating. We're standing, we're sitting here on the evergreen stage, which is um, uh, kind of, s kind of, fascinatingly, kind of pseudo nature. Yeah, made out of dead wood. <laughs> in the midst of the technic. Yeah. Um, I, one but, of the most, uh, the, the moment when I knew humanity in some ways had just jumped the shark, if you will, um, mm -hmm. or San Francisco at the very least was. There was a while, maybe three years ago, four years ago, where every bus in San Francisco had a beautiful picture of nature. Um, and then the slogan was, go visit your screensaver. <laughs> oh, the, the pain in that. Yeah. The it's pain. Where, uh, once again, this goes back to like the technic or the technopoly, sorrow, yeah. it's, which is our image of what the natural world is yes. uh, comes now by the thing that we stare at every day and that shines blue light into right. our eyes. Yeah, yeah, blue lighting. Yep, blue, blue lighting. lighting. And, and uh, you know, one of the things uh, about, um, you know, I think living in the Technic uh, is that we, we, can, we can just so easily step out of it. Right. It's just so exactly. easy. It's actually, it's actually incredibly easy. You know, we, we just step a little bit to the left. We just turn off our devices. We just yeah. kind of, well, like, walk out on the streets. This to me is, like, one of the... Like, there's a kind of, you can call it cultural gaslighting that I, I think we as technology companies do, but yeah. like uh, the whole attention economy, Facebook, YouTube, and here, here is sort of like the fundamental lie or the abuse, which is, um, you know, the simplest version of it is to say, uh, you know, they put hundreds of engineers behind every screen. We have the smartest supercomputers that we then sick on trying to find the content that'll keep you around. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're addicted, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And even yeah. worse, like, yeah. we just, we're, we're told that we get, like, we are just given what we want. When we open up our Facebook news feed or when we see YouTube recommendations, it's just feeding us what we want. And there's like a fundamental bug in the, just the, the thought processes um, of the epistemology of like that word want, because it's not what we want. No. It's what we can't help but look at. And there's a kind of preying on our neuroplasticity that's going on here. Like we can't help yeah. as humans, like we have, it's a instinct hacking. We can't help yeah. but look at a car crash. When we it's go it's basically like a, a security exploit. Yeah, exactly. Is basically what it is. Exactly. It's, it's like a kind of biological security exploit. And you know, here's the thing that, that I, I, have, I have found really interesting is that I, I um, when you think about what robots, what, what technology, what software, what computers can do, what it actually excludes are the things that humans in particular and especially can do, which is have compassion, mm. have emotion, fall in love, yep. care for one another. And all of these things are not accomplishable or achievable or by measurable. machines or measurable yeah. by machines. They're, they're non-numeric. And um, I, it was interesting. I read, a, I read an article that was um, basically saying that you know, a, a, an AI-dominated future mm. is interestingly a feminist future, which I thought was interesting because um, qualities that are, are most frequently attributed to women, yeah. all of those things, human connection, mm. compassion, care. Yeah. Um, the teaching professions, nursing, yeah. um, you know, you know, are, are things that are not, you know, they're, they're like, you know, anybody who's been in the uncanny valley of being served by a robot, um, which, which is probably happening somewhere here on the floor of Slush, um, 
I'm sure that opportunity is available to all of us right now. Um, um, is is you know, it's it's very clear what it is not. So and I, what it is not is those things that are special to us. So I hear there's like this trope of empathy is one of those special things that only humans do. Hmm. And I'm really worried that that's another case of humans liking to think we're special. But actually, my hunch is that empathy is going to be one of the biggest back doors into the human mind. So here's some art that I've been thinking about doing. Yeah. Um, uh, and it sort of plays on the idea of like, how yeah. hackable are we? How leadable are we? Um, so imagine a, a, one of those new deep uh, faked generated faces that can just do whatever face it wants. And you walk up to a screen. Imagine like you walk into a dark room. There's a light. Uh, there's a screen in front of you. And on it is one of these like AI generated faces. And there's a little camera that watches your face. And it just mirrors you. Anything you do, it just does right back. And if you've done eye gazing, you know that you like. Right. It's a, oh, it's a, actually, you should all do this. Find somebody <laughs> in the audience and just eye gaze with them for like two minutes. It's super uncomfortable. There'll be lots of emotions that come up. And your faces will start to like will align and eventually they'll like they'll be doing the same face at the same time mm -hmm. um, and just like if you smile um, you get happier uh, if you force yourself to like frown you get sadder yeah so imagine the AI sort of like you do it you eye gaze for a little bit until you like it catches you and you're doing yeah. the same thing and then it just starts drifting you very slowly towards some emotion happiness sadness kindness it, it just well, Facebook, it like, the Facebook researchers were already doing this uh, to us, actually. It's true, but if, at, the, if, you know, at the text if, level and at the image level. Yeah, at and the here is like yeah. we can just hack some of like right. our, we can hack mirror neurons. Sure. Um, and the idea being like, w w I think there's a whole bunch of fun things you can play with this once you have it, but yeah. empathy isn't, I think, just a thing that humans can do. You know the thing. Yeah, here's the thing: is is there should be some kind. You know how your um, the gas in your house has an added stink so that when you have yeah, a gas yeah. leak, you know it, because otherwise you can't smell it and yep. you, you would just perish un unbeknownst to yourself. It seems as if these systems should have some kind of stink uh, that's added to them yeah. so that you're aware when you are communicating with an AI and mm -hmm. have the potential to be manipulated. Agreed. That's a great <laughs> idea. It's sort of like the, uh, uh, the Blade Runner law. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Blinky lights. Okay, that's it for us. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>